want a bank job, we're going to speak about dyslipidemia. So it's actually a little bit greasy lecture, so let's hope that it passes smoothly, and let's see this together. The lecture is entitled How to Apply the ASC Guidelines in Our Practice. Actually, the previous lecture by Dr. Bessim was tackling the issue from a near aspect. The next lecture by Dr. Haitham will be tackling this issue also in the form of clinical applied cases. So actually, I don't know why it's not working from here, so can you switch to the next slide? So this is the guidelines by the European Society of Cardiology associated with the European Association of Atherosclerosis. Next, please. Which one? Okay. So this is how I do it. This is how I practice with my patient. The patient comes to my clinic and I start taking history. While I'm taking history from the patient, I'm minded to do three particular jobs. Assess this patient risk, and as we know, this guidelines has some charts and has some numbers. So where am I going to put the patient in which chart and how am I going to tackle the number that I have in the lipid profile? The second issue is which lipid parameter do I need to target? I'm targeting the total cholesterol or the LDL or the triglycerides or the apolipoprotein or what? And is there additional risk modifiers that can affect the risk profile of this patient or not? After I answer this question, I will have my patient located in a specific risk profile. According to this risk profile, I will plan my management strategy. My management is based upon achieving a specific target for a specific marker using a specific agent. And at the end of this situation, sometimes I have special conditions which need some specific points to look at. So this is the first one how to use the risk estimation chart, and what are the recommendations for cardiovascular disease risk estimation. Let's agree upon one point. Not every patient entering my clinic or your clinic will find his place on the score chart. Because sometimes the patient is very high risk or high risk from the start that he will not qualify to enter the chart by any means. This patient is very high risk because he had a previous atherosclerotic, cerebrovascular, cardiovascular, peripheral vascular disease event, he had something going on, he had an acute coronary syndrome, he placed a previous stent, or even this patient is diabetic or chronic kidney disease, those profile of patients will not enter the score chart. They will be managed as high risk and very high risk patient and will be tackled aggressively to lowering the LDL to the maximum. If the patient if the patient is not one of the high risk or the very high risk, okay, he will enter the score system and he will put on the chart. What does the score system calculate? The score chart calculates the 10 years risk of cardiovascular disease of a specific individual. يعني بعد 10 سنين الريسك إن المريض ده يموت من cardiovascular event. So when I say that the score is 8%, or 4% or 2%, this means that this gentleman or this lady's risk to have a 10-year cardiovascular disease death is particular number percent. Okay, it's composed of five points. The total cholesterol, the systolic blood pressure before treatment, on the first visit, not after treatment, because after treatment, the score will be reduced because my medications will be working and I'm modifying the risk factors, profiles of this patient. And the gender, and the smoking, and the age. Let's say something here. Those charts were proposed by the European Society of Cardiology, and the European Society of Cardiology classified the European countries into high-risk countries and low-risk countries. And since we are following the European Society of Cardiology, so we, as Egypt, and several other countries, were classified as very high risk. So the high risk chart here underestimates the risk of the Egyptian patient. So this point needs to be noted, okay? 
As you see here, the chart is two big columns, males and females, then non-smokers and smokers. You have the age in the middle, and you have the total cholesterol on the horizontal axis and the systolic blood pressure on the vertical axis. You can easily find your patient and locate him according to the nearest measurements that you have on the first visit. And as you see, the dark red is the highest risk, the light red is the high risk, the yellow is the moderate risk, and the green is the low risk. And as you also notice from here, that for age of 70, it's all red. For age of 65, it's nearly all red. Whatever, if you're a male, if you're a female, if you're a smoker, if you're a not smoker, even if your blood pressure is 120 or your blood pressure is 180. So do not be surprised if you get a specific section on the guidelines telling you in person that, dear cardiologist, older age patient need to be aggressively treated and their LDL needs to be aggressively lowered. This is because age by its own put all those patients in the red profile. And the younger the age here at 50, it starts to get green and yellow. At 40, it's green and yellow, almost green. And this is for the low-risk countries. And this is for the young patients below 40. The risk is nearly 4, 1, 2, 3, except if you are a smoker with a high blood pressure and high cholesterol, then your risk will be high 10 and 12. And here what we get to illustrate the risk age concept. If you are a 40 years old gentleman, and you are a smoker, and your risk factor is the same, you'll be down there at the 3%, compared to the non-smoker, 65 years old gentleman with a lower blood cholesterol. So the total cholesterol, if elevated, and you are a smoker, puts your percent at a 3% equivalent to the same gentleman at the 65 years of age with controlled blood cholesterol and non-smoker. And this is what we called the risk age concept. This is very useful in explaining to your patient and convincing him the lifestyle modifications and the life advice modifications that you need to tell him by cessation of smoking and adhering to your medication. Because Professor Besson showed us in the previous presentation that there is a gap between the optimum and the real. You can convince your patient by something like this. If you're 40 years old and you're not controlled and you're a smoker and blah, 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 you're like a 65. This is what we said previously. And so we get here that it is not one risk factor. It's multiple risk factors. And those are the basis for the total cardiovascular risk estimation and management. Risk factor screening, screening for the population using a lipid profile should be considered in all males above 40 and females above 50 of age or postmenopausal. And the score system, if the patient qualifies to be applied upon by the score system, will assist in making a logical management decisions and may help to avoid under and over treatment. Do not forget that some persons are high or very high risk and do not need to qualify for the score system. This is true for patients with documented cardiovascular disease, diabetes, familial hypercholesterolemia, chronic kidney disease, carotid or femoral plaques, coronary artery calcium score more than 100, or extreme lipoprotein A evaluation. This is the very high risk patient, and this is the high risk profile. The moderate risk profiles are the younger ones, type 1 diabetes at age less than 35, type 2 less than 50, or diabetes duration less than 10 years without other risk factors, or on the score system they are calculated to be between 1 and 5%. And the low risk patients are those below 1% risk for a 10-year cardiovascular fatal event. So this is the first question answered. Where do I put my patient upon the chart? The second question, which number will I be looking at in the patient's lipid profile? Of course, the score system includes the total cholesterol, so the total cholesterol is needed. The HDL system is used 
to further refine the score system. And as I'm going to show you here, you have the same patient. Let's take the patient in the upper panel on the left side, which is a non-smoker lady with a blood pressure of 140 systolic and age of 65. She has a risk of 4 upon the score system. Without HDL, it's 4. If the HDL is 0.8, the risk is 8. If the HDL is 1.8, the risk is 3. So adding the HDL for further refinement of the regular score system moves the patient from 3% to 8%. It's nearly tripled her risk. You can apply this also to males, and you can apply this for all age groups. Question number three, what are the risk modifiers? There are factors modifying the score risk, and if you search these factors, you will find why Egypt and other similar countries were included in the very high-risk population, where even the high-risk score chart underestimates our risk as Egyptian. Social deprivation, obesity, especially central obesity, physical inactivity, psychosocial stress, family history of premature cardiovascular disease, and chronic immune inflammatory disorders. Major psychiatric disorders, HIV treatment, AF, LVH, chronic kidney disease, obstructive sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver. If you do your patient an investigation, this is actually 2A recommendation in the guidelines, you can do furthermore cardiovascular image as an additional risk stratifier for your patient. You can assess the carotid arterial or femoral arterial plaque burden on ultrasound for the low and moderate risk patients, and these can move them one step up. And you can make the routine calcium score, not multi-slice CT with contrast, no, no, routine calcium score, and if the calcium score is above 100, you can move your patient one step upwards. Lipoprotein A measurement should be considered also at least once upon the lifetime of every adult and identify those with very high inherited lipoprotein A levels above 180 milligrams per deciliter because those persons have a lifetime risk equivalent to those with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Okay. How am I going to plan my management strategy? What are my targets and what are the agents or tools? We have 100 slides to represent this, but let's see just a simple flow chart. If I'm very high, I'm dark red. My target is 55 milligrams per deciliter. If I'm high, I'm light red, my target is 70 milligrams per deciliter. If I got a cardiovascular event or cerebrovascular event while I am on those targets as a patient, my target will be a 50% reduction from the baseline. I have a patient, he got an acute coronary syndrome. One week previously, his LDL was 80. What is my target? My target is 40. 50% reduction because he already got an acute coronary syndrome event at low LDL level. So my target here is 50% reduction. If the patient is moderate risk, the target is 100. If the patient is low risk, the target is 116. This is the flow chart. This is the magnification. You assess the total risk. You measure the baseline LDL. You search for the risk modifiers for subclinical atherosclerosis, as we said, the carotid arterial and femoral arterial plaques by ultrasound and calcium score by CT. And then you ask yourself a question, does this patient follow one of those? Yes, he does. Okay, let's see the indication for the drug therapy. Define the treatment goal. What is the number that you are tackling? and use a high potency statins at the highest recommended dose and tolerable by the patient. 
Did you achieve your goal? Yes or no? I achieved my goal, it's fine. I need to follow up this patient annually or biannually, clinical and laboratory follow-up. If not, then I add to the highest dose statins, is it a MIP? Did I achieve my target? Yes, I will follow up. No, then I add a PCSK9 inhibitor. And PCSK9 inhibitor are indicated per se for secondary prevention in the very high risk profile that we said that does not qualify to the risk score and for primary prevention in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia and another major risk factor. Both of those are very high risk. And PCSK9 is indicated in primary prevention for patients at very high risk even if they not have familial hypercholesterolemia. Cholesterolic. Number three, in the last five minutes, we will be discussing just a few scenarios. Hypertriglyceridemia, Dr. Bassem Zarif said in his lecture that statins are the first drug of choice for reducing cardiovascular disease in patients with hypertriglyceridemia more than 200. And in those between 135 and 500, after the reduced trial now, we can add the icosapent ethyl 2 by 2 grams per day. In primary prevention, for those who are the LDL goal already achieved, but the triglycerides is still high, above 200, you can combine statins with phenofibrate or bezafibrate. And in the high-risk patient also who are at the LDL the LDL goal is controlled while the triglyceride is still more than 200. Phenofibrate or visafibrate also may be considered in combination with statins. <coughs> Familial hypercholesterolemia is an issue that was raised and focused upon specially in the 2019 guidelines. This is the Dutch Lipid Clinical Network diagnostic criteria for familial hypercholesterolemia. It's composed of several items, and you calculate the points at the end. The family history is important. The clinical history of coronary artery disease and peripheral arterial disease, premature age. Physical examination, tendinous xanthomas, arcus, arcus corneales, and the LDL, LDL level before initiating the treatment. At the end, you do the DNA analysis to search for the functional mutation, and then you calculate your score. It's a definite familial hypercholesterolemia if the score is more than eight points. It's a probable if the score between six and eight, and it's a possible if the score is between three and five. And if you got this diagnosis, this is how you treat. You treat the last one for familial hypercholesterolemia patient who are at very high risk, treatment to achieve at least a 50% reduction from the baseline, and an LDL level less than 55 milligram per deciliter. This is a very high risk profile. They do not qualify to the score charts. They are treated with the maximum aggressive tolerated doses of statins. If not, add ezetimibe. If not, add PCSK9. Target, 55 and less than 50% reduction of the baseline. For heterozygous, for primary prevention, you have the same, but it's not class 1, class 2A. For us, it's the same. You need to reduce to 55 and to 50% reduction. PCSK9 is recommended in very high risk familial hypercholesterolemia if the treatment goal is not achieved on the maximum tolerated statin plus ezetimibe. And for children, you need to test it starting from the age of 5 five years old child. And children with familial hypercholesterolemia should be educated to adopt a proper diet and treated with statins starting from the age of eight, starting from the age of eight. And the goals of treatment should be LDL less than 135 at the age of 10. For women, it's the same. Do not under treat ladies, just treat them as you treat men. For elderly, as I said previously, and we remember this chart, they are all red above the age of 70. 
and most of them are read at the age of 65, so please be as aggressive as the regular population. For metabolic syndrome and diabetes, 50% reduction from the baseline, target is less than 55 with type 2 diabetes and very high risk. If type 2 diabetes and high risk, not very high risk, the target is 70. And statins are recommended in patients with type 1 diabetes who are at high or very high risk. So both type 1 and type, di and type 2 diabetes are receiving statins. If the goal is not reached with statins, you add azetiomibe. If the goal is not reached with azetiomibe, you can follow the same previously. With acute coronary syndrome, of course, it goes without saying. This is a very high risk. You're going to follow the, high, the least possible targets. And if the patient put a previous stent, next please, you're going to do the same. Even you're going to do pre-treatment if you're going to do a primary PCI. Routine pre-treatment or loading, even if the patient is on previous therapy, like he's on atorvastatin 10 milligrams and he presented by an acute anterior STEMI, and you're going to do the patient a primary PCI, you're going to preload him with atorvastatin 80 milligrams. Because this has a role not only for the lipid reduction, but also for the plaque stabilization and the plaque healing process. I finished my time. Okay, I need just 10 seconds for those with cerebral vascular disease and those with peripheral arterial disease. It's the same. It's the same like those with coronary artery disease, highest statins, statin plus ezetimibe and PCSK9. We do not need to give statins routinely in heart failure patients. We do not need to give statins routinely in valvular heart disease patients. We do not need to give statins routinely in aortic stenosis patients, okay? We do not need to give statins routinely in those patients. For chronic kidney disease, chronic kidney disease puts your patient in the high, very high risk, so you follow up the previous. If the patient on dialysis, you do give him statins also, no problem, so long as for organ transplantations, Yes, you need to give it, but you need to take care of the drug-drug interactions, especially with cyclosporin. And thank you. Uh, Dr. Zahran. Uh,